Trevor, thank you very much for the introduction. I've been introduced many times over 20 years of working with eGain, but never quite that way. So thank you for that. Um, there's normally reference to Terminator films, that kind of stuff that goes on, but you, know, you can see why, I guess. Um, I, I also must apologize because I didn't go out last night, but I have the sore throat that suggests I did. Um, so forgive me, I may need to have a water break as we, as we run through this session. Um, so yeah, so I, I've been around in the knowledge management space, in the multi-channel space uh, with eGain for two decades. It sounds horrible when I say that. Um, a lot of colleagues, um, a lot younger than me, so sometimes when I discuss films that I like, they have no idea at all what I'm talking about. Um, but it was, it was very, very interesting yesterday. You know, 20 years um, comes with a lot of baggage. Maybe sometimes you think that things aren't moving forward anymore, you know, you can, you can get a little bit jaded. But some of the things I heard yesterday with our, our customers, you know, Bill from Comcast speaking, um, with, the, uh, with Laura from CEB telling us the, the, the state of the art in terms of research in this space, and with Zach from Cisco, all these things kind of coming together, then suddenly you start getting, you know, you start getting infused again. It's tough to get a two-decade sort of tenure guy infused again, but I'm, I'm getting infused. The, the CJA stuff looks like a fantastic way forward, and we'll get through to, um, to, to how that fits in this. So my, my remit this morning is to talk to you about knowledge management. And you'll have noticed that it said push knowledge management. We're going to get there. That's aspirational. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by just getting the ground rules out there. Let's talk about what knowledge management is. As a comparison to content management, I cringe when I say content management because it's, it's, it's a pain for me in many ways. It's, it gets in the way sometimes of what knowledge is. It confuses the picture. But, but let's, let's, let's do that. Let's go through that process. Um, then we're going to take a look at why knowledge is relevant. We're going to run through eight notable knowledge deployments. And I got to choose what notable means, so forgive me if you don't think they're notable, but I'm going to pull out some things. It's a very superficial, high-level run over the top of those. Uh, we'll pull out some notable things, and then, then we'll start bringing those learnings together a little bit in terms of how knowledge management deployments can be successful. And then ultimately, we'll get on to how the active knowledge aspiration can be brought to life. So, fantastic question, what is knowledge? And a great quote here um, from Mitch Kapoor, um, founder of Lotus, and then later founder of the Mozilla um, organization. So he, he knows his stuff around uh, internet. Um, the internet is massive. The internet is full of content. The internet is full of data, full of information. The question is, is the internet knowledge? And my answer would be no. When you go into a contact center, if you go into a place where knowledge exists, where knowledge is being used, sometimes it's easy to spot that there is knowledge in that contact center because there are specialists. Sometimes you don't often see the guy with the white coat and the, you know, the, the big head who's obviously an expert, but expertise exists and is, is, is obvious. Content, information, data, for me, becomes knowledge when it is relevant to the situation you're in and when it is timely. So content can be knowledge, but not all content is knowledge. And sometimes organizations that I go into have a very, very strong content management culture, but are actually missing this concept of knowledge. So content management will give you fantastic processes and procedures for generating the content, quality control, pushing it out. But the thing it's missing is the focus on the use. So you can have fantastic processes to build that content. If you're not making that content work in a relevant way in the moment for individuals, then it stays as content. It has less value, in my opinion. OK, Albert Einstein. We had to get Albert Einstein in. He's been a theme, if you like, through the presentations today. He comes up again a little bit later in a, in a strange way. So, so why is knowledge relevant? And forgive me, please, as I get onto this slide, because the guys in CEB have done years of research. I spent a Wednesday afternoon thinking this through, and I've come up with I think, what I think is a mathematical proof that knowledge is relevant. Okay, So go with me on this. Challenge me if you want later on, but go with me. So look at this fantastic mathematics, first thing in the morning. So customer experience is a function of, and saying is a function of is fantastic, because that means I can, I can blur the lines. It's fuzzy, yeah? It's something to do with 
customer effort and the outcome. Yeah, it's fantastic um, to make something easy, but I still might be annoyed because I didn't get the outcome you wanted. So that's mixed in there as well. The emotional piece that Laura talked about is very much in there. Yeah? If I, if, I, um, if I get a great outcome, but it took me a whole bunch of time to, to get to that great outcome, it takes the shine off. Yeah? So it, it, that kind of works for me. Yeah? I'm seeing a few nodding heads. That's quite good. And then customer effort is a function of people doing something, transacting, or trying to find something out, information gathering, across multiple channels. Okay. Now, the killer here, finding something out, is knowledge management. Doing something quite often needs knowledge management to make that doing effective and efficient. So my thesis here, and I will give this to CEB to put in a revision of their, their book when it comes out next year. Um, my thesis here is that knowledge management is fundamental in terms of customer effort, and customer effort is fundamental in terms of the customer experience. Okay? I think the Nobel Peace Prize, or the Nobel Prize is coming quite shortly, actually, based on this. Okay, so who, who can we learn from? Okay. I did ask Ashu if we could have these guys come up, you know, direct, make, some, make a PA, but uh, he, you know, he's so mean sometimes he wouldn't, he wouldn't support me on this. So we can learn from mature deployments. Gandalf or Ian McKellen, sorry, Ian McKellen, if you want, both, both mature figures. We can learn from attractive Bradley Cooper. Heterosexual male, but I find Bradley Cooper attractive. I have to admit it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Those eyes, you know? Um, <laughs> Audrey Hepburn, the sophisticated. So we're going to look at a couple of sophisticated knowledge deployments. And then last of all, Katy Perry, well-connected deployments. Katy Perry is the most followed individual on Twitter. I don't know whether you knew that. So in, in, in the Twitter space, she is the most well-connected celebrity we have. So these guys are going to help us go through this process. So. Two examples. Barclays Bank, seventh largest financial organization in the world, something like 48 million customers doing retail banking, investments, wholesale banking. British Gas, they heat my home, so they're important. They've been around for quite a few years in terms of knowledge management, and there's some, some very interesting things about their deployments. Barclays Bank, so it may seem to you that when you decide to pay an individual from your bank to their bank, it's a very seamless um, process uh, or effortless, but actually it is a black art. There are so many different banking systems that have to join together. There are stages your transaction can get to install, and the impact to you is actually quite significant if that doesn't happen. If the other guy doesn't get his money, if you don't get your money, it's, it's stress. Um, but it is a black art. So there's a con considerable amount of training in Barclays on processes, on procedures to troubleshoot this. So Barclays took EGAN guided help and they built that expertise into the knowledge base. They were able to move their contact center 50 miles from where it originally was and pretty much lost 60, 70% of their staff. But because that knowledge was in the system, no impact. Yeah? So systemic knowledge, systemic knowledge management. The use of the knowledge is mandatory. So they cannot raise a ticket in their CRM system unless they have used the knowledge base. Now, it's controversial in some ways. There's, there's often two, two conversations or two, two ways we can do this in terms of usage, encouragement or mandatory. They've gone mandatory. Oh, excuse me, wrong attraction. So the guided help actually brings them huge benefits in terms of a very complex problem space. The knowledge being in the system makes it transferable. But a knowledge culture has to be in place. This is one of the success factors from these guys. Barclays actually taught us that there needs to be a knowledge team and a knowledge architect. So they have someone who understands the way the knowledge is built, who can advise, he never goes hands-on and does stuff, he knows the architecture of the knowledge base. He knows how it grows, how it should be grown, 
how to do things with the knowledge base. So there's a knowledge lead architect that's in this. So the culture is very, very important to them. They've been a customer since 1998. Last year, their sister organization in South Africa, ABSA, decided they needed exactly the same kind of solution. They have 14 different banking systems they support, banking channels they, channels they support. It takes an agent something like 10 years to become competent in working across those 14 channels. By putting this in place, they're anticipating a month on each of the 14 channels will be enough to get an agent up to speed, relying on the knowledge base that's there. British Gas. So um, this is uh, a deployment that's been around, I think, since uh, 2002. Um, British Gas have a section of the population who have prepay gas meters. So these are guys that are, you know, they're, they're not well off. They're, they're, they, they go to a local store, they buy a little plastic stick that gets put into a meter and a little bit breaks off, so they can't reuse it, and they get a certain amount of gas. So if their meter fails, if the prepayment doesn't kind of go through, they're screwed. You know, there's, there's no hot water, there's no heating, there's no cooking. So you know, it's, it's pretty fundamental to them, a huge impact if, if this doesn't get, get done. And British Gas have a whole bunch of engineers who have to go out and fix these things, so they have a significant problem. The engineers get out with the wrong diagnosis, um, they can't repair things, there's another day to wait till the engineer comes back and so on. So a lot, again, of impact that's in this... Uh, in the scope of the, uh, the, the contact center. Um, they don't mandate use, but they've found that the customer satisfaction is significantly higher if the agent does use the knowledge base on the call, so they encourage. Yeah? They avoid 35% of the engineering visits that they used to have. And an engineering visit may cost 60 or 70 pounds to do. They predict the parts that are needed to fix, based on the diagnosis, the diagnosis that's going on. So engineer repeat visits don't happen either. And that's something, that's a theme you'll see coming out of this. Where we deploy knowledge, guided help effectively, there's often benefits outside of the contact center. So the benefit case when you roll it all up is beyond just the customer service space. It's worth looking at. They have three people, not three FTE, they're part-time, that maintain their knowledge base. Because this stuff doesn't change very often, but they have a massive change coming. British government legislation says everyone has to change from dumb meters that need a guy to come along and note down the number to smart meters. Smart meters are a whole bunch more complex, which means there's going to be a whole bunch more problems. No one is an expert on smart meters. So it begs the question, how do you build a knowledge base when no one has the expertise? So what they're doing, their organization, their their employees are the first people to get smart meters. And they are building up an experience-based knowledge base in anticipation of the rollout to go on further. Now, they've had to flex above the three FTE to do that kind of stuff. So they're, they're, you know, they're, they're dealing with the, uh, the surge, if you like, in the pipeline and the knowledge stuff. But they're able to do that. They have a, they have a, a good knowledge culture. They can, they can plan for this and, and, and anticipate this stuff. Hey, Bradley. <coughs> He's back again. I have to look away. He's so attractive. Um, <laughs> Anderson Windows. 110 years of producing windows and doors. As you could imagine, a portfolio which is huge, growing, very flexible, componentized. Very fundamental elements in your home. You know, when these things go wrong, it's, it, you know, it, it hurts you. But very difficult to have a conversation with someone on the phone about which door I've got, which window I've got, and stuff like that. How to repair things. So these guys have taken guided help and just overlaid rich media on top of this. So when you go to select which, which product you actually have before they can help you with the diagnostic, both in the contact center and in self-service, pictures. So simple. Pictures are content being used as knowledge in this particular case. So fantastic, we can go through guided help. The answers to the questions in guided help are the pictures that we click on. We go right through this process. When we get to the kind of resolution you want, or they have to send you a part, or you bought a part from their store, they'll send you a video to show how to use it. So rich media really being used to, you know, the, the trite expression, picture paints a thousand words. 
this is what these guys are doing. So a beautiful example of an attractive knowledge management deployment that's really giving them significant benefits. So the customers are now finding stuff. The phone calls are tailing off. The single knowledge base dream that we sell, um, you know, the same knowledge base profiled for self-service and in the contact center. Um, something that Laura mentioned yesterday, um, experience engineering is another theme you'll see in these. Knowledge bases in the contact center that have additional information that helps the agent in terms of the way they talk to customers. So knowledge base not just about solving the problem, but about how to articulate the question or how to articulate uh, an answer, to explain. Yeah, experience engineering language is, is built into this as well. The customers love it. They're getting benefits from it. And it's pretty, so I quite like it. EE. -E. It's very hard to say. Everything everywhere. They used to be called, then they shortened that to EE. EE -E. -E are a, uh, they are the largest mobile telco in the UK. They are a merger of T-Mobile in the UK and Orange in the UK which to anyone who comes from Europe, you'll realize that's pretty crazy because one is French and one is German. And that's never a good mix. Apologies at the back of the room to the French and German colleagues I have. <coughs> um, even more difficult with this, um, they wanted to retain the two brands they had originally and have a third one. Two organizations merging, four knowledge bases, three brands. We did it. It was tough. There were deadlines that meant we couldn't take all the knowledge into one single knowledge base. We had to have some knowledge in the system that was in e-game. We had to have some knowledge in the system where we were calling out to other knowledge sources, and we had to federate some stuff. But gradually, it's all coming into the knowledge base. This user interface, this is the first piece of work I've seen where we used an external design agency to build an agent desktop. So there's a whole document, 60, 70, 80 pages, of why design decisions were made to make this an efficient desktop for knowledge. What happens behind the scenes here, it's quite interesting, when, a call, sorry, when an agent logs in, an agent has a set of skills, the view of the knowledge base is brought in by one dimension. When the customer calls in, the screen pop, the information we get from the, the CTI, we know what type of call the customer's got, we put another dimension on the profile. So we're narrowing this down. And then the third dimension is customer context. We know the product the customer has and the services they have, and the knowledge base view shrinks again. So they're pretty focused. What, when their desktop shrinks down, they kind of know roughly where in the knowledge base they're going to start out. So a lovely um, compacting of those dimensions um, in terms of the agent desktop and what they, what they can see. On the right-hand side, they've also got customer information from CRM that's, that's fed through too. Yeah? So really nice, neat, attractive design for efficiency in the contact center. You can't really see this. One point to make, they also use next best activity. So the knowledge base is actually flagging, the e -game knowledge base is flagging when next best activity might be relevant, and the next best activity comes from a third party system, but is brought in. Yeah? So just we, we, we say this is the time to do it. We go and get it from someone else. So productivity designed into the user interface. So user acceptance is fantastic. Again, uh, they mandate the use of this because it's built into their, into their processes. Um, all that context focuses the knowledge base, um, and we have all different kinds of knowledge sources that are in there. Um, sophisticated. Audrey Hepburn. Interestingly, um, well, unfortunately, she died in 1993, but is still doing TV adverts. So computer-generated graphics, whatever. She's, she's just done a chocolate bar advert in the UK, which is quite... Quite spooky, really. Um, <coughs> so the Ukes are um, an interesting company. Ukes are a e-commerce outsourcer. So I wouldn't have ever thought that guys like Amani or Prada would not have their own e-commerce infrastructure. But they choose to use Ukes for their online shops in 56 countries. Um, the logistics of delivering. The, uh, the goods you buy, and customer service is all outsourced to Ux. They have a single knowledge base in multiple languages. I, I was trying to work out exactly how many they have, because they're now rolling out their own languages, and I got up to nine, I think. So they have a single knowledge base, 56 countries where the delivery information is different, 
and a hundred and something portals onto the same knowledge base. So think about that in terms of the multiple dimensions. In the knowledge base, they use e-gain macros to localize based on geography. And actually, as you go through, you can see, you know, this is, this is the main landing page for support in uh, English, Russian, and Japanese, it looks like. That's, so that's three of them. So fantastic, you know, n-dimensional cube of knowledge management, but shrunk down to, you know, a very manageable um, proposition in terms of um, language translation, in terms of locality, and so on. Single version of the truth, which we always go on about. So fantastic for those guys. LexisNexis, I have to confess, I know less about LexisNexis. It's a North American deployment. The thing I love about LexisNexis, this is a, uh, they have our, our, our technology in a number of places. This is a medical malpractice advice system. Okay? So who'd have thought there was a market there for that kind of stuff? But, you know, computer assisted legal advice is what LexisNexis do. Um, if you are considering um, taking up a case for medical malpractice, this will give you an idea about your potential for success. So their USP, their notable element here, is that they have thousands, millions potentially, of legal cases that their authoring team have built into the system. Now, this is, a, in my mind, as far from content management as you can possibly get. Each of these is, is legal precedent. This is whether, you know, the attributes of a, of, a, of a medical case, what happened, and the award that was made, the financial award. So someone can use this system and work out whether they have a good chance, whether it's worth their while pursuing a medical malpractice case. And the interesting thing here is it's good that partial matches, so, so a partial match might actually be very, very informative. You don't have to get the right answer. You have to, maybe you get something which is close enough to say this is worth doing. Or maybe it's close enough, but there isn't enough money in terms of the, the, the previous award, the precedent set. Yeah? So we're not using knowledge as an absolute here. We're using a very, very broad set of information as knowledge in the moment to choose and make a decision about whether to go ahead with this. Katy Perry. I like Katy too. Just to balance up the, uh, <coughs> the other stuff. <laughs> um, so, two European customers again. Yorkshire Water. Um, does what it says on the tin. They are a, uh, a water company, 1.7 million customers in the UK, uh, and Orange specifically in France. So they're cousins of the EE guys, but they're not allowed to talk anymore, all that kind of stuff. So Yorkshire Water are well connected because, again, their processes are pretty complicated when you're trying to work out uh, problems that people have with their water supply, uh, if someone's dug up the road and a whole area is out and stuff like that, legislation kicks in and so on. They had as much problem with their Clarify CRM system. Let's see if anyone's smiling around the room that has Clarify. Um, they had as much problem driving. So they, they needed to train their agents to drive the system, and they needed to train their agents about the troubleshooting. So they had two problems. So we solved that by putting eGain guided help behind Clarify, and we drive Clarify. So these guys don't need to know which tab to go to next. We do that stuff for them. So we've got the process, and we've got the troubleshooting, the business process and troubleshooting all together. And again, going outside of the contact center, these guys have 30% um, less engineer visits. So there's a real business case for doing something right in the contact center that prevents cost downstream. So building up that business case just in customer service just doesn't get the full picture. They've also outsourced their contact center twice, three times, something like that. Just on a whim, they can do that because they have systemic knowledge. They just bring a whole bunch of new agents in in the outsourcer, they introduce them to the system, and they go. So we have portability now of expertise, portability of knowledge. Orange France. These are probably the most sophisticated in terms of the way they have wrapped eGain's product, eGain's offering. This little set of boxes on the screen looks very simple. This is what the French would call le synoptique. I like the accent. Um, <coughs> le synoptique is driven by um, 
data calls, when they have a customer on uh, calling to the contact center, they use line test tools that go right the way up to the DSL filter in the customer's house. If the customer has a set-top box, because they do IPTV over, over their broadband, it can go to the set-top box and do diagnostics there as well. So front to back, they are doing diagnostics while talking to the customer. That data comes back in and fills in tick boxes or crosses on the synoptique. It drives where the diagnostic process goes next. Now, it's interesting because the agents, when we first put this in place, it's, it's interesting because the agents start off doing a diagnostic process and then data comes back later and can bounce them off in another direction. So they, they kind of have to fill in for a little while while the data, the, the asymmetric calls come back because they don't quite know where they're going to go next. They can go down common problem routes and so on like that, but they have to wait for that data to come together. But data is everything as far as these guys are concerned. In terms of the impacts, or sorry, actually in terms of the cost, they have 40 FTE that do uh, knowledge management, but their end user base is 14,000 agents. There is a benefit case. Despite the fact there is a very large obvious cost of knowledge management in those 40 FTE, the benefits, the payback on the system was just over a year, I think 13 months. Their customer service VP stood up at our user conference in EMEA three years ago and said, if a mobile telco, a quad play telco, is not using something like this, he doesn't understand how they can survive. So fantastic um, affirmation that the knowledge base in the center of this customer service organization is delivering and can deliver at this kind of scale. But it's not all about the technology. It's fantastic to have technology. Some of the things you've, you've heard me talking about here, the knowledge base as we go through for its, for its success has to be accurate. Nothing, agents, nothing drives agents away from using knowledge base more than inaccuracies they spot that aren't fixed pretty quickly. It's got to be usable. It's got to make their life easier, not harder. And it's got to be of value to the business. So you've got to prove that ROI continuously. You may have ROI on day one, 30 days, 90 days, a year later, are you still delivering the same ROI? Has the business changed? Those kind of things have all got to be considered. So this kind of stuff is all critical. And we can call out some of those examples that I've just shown you against some of these elements. So user adoption, you know, Anderson and their pictures in the contact center and in self-service. EE, a desktop designed for user adoption for um, efficiency. Um, in terms of the KB design, the Barclays Bank guys knowledge architect. Yeah? All of these elements are necessary for a knowledge base to deploy, persist, and be successful. And we can actually look at this a different way. So we could look at a checklist to see if we're doing the right things as far as the knowledge base is concerned. So is the knowledge base, um, has, does it have basic hygiene? You know, do we understand the requirements? And do we have processes to deliver the basic maintenance that needs to go on. You know, operationally, does it work? And are we able to, um, to show with MI that it's working? Have we got stakeholders that are bought into this? Are we able to respond to change? So going back to the guys in British Gas, when that big moment of truth comes, when we move from dumb meters to smart meters, are we able to flex? And do we have a process by which we can get there? And then, is this understood as a, at an exec level? Do executives recognize knowledge management and the need for a team that's delivering strategic operational benefits? All those things, I, I'm, I would love to say that I know a customer that has absolutely everything of this in place. I'm sure there are parts of it there. But if we have all these, we can, we can succeed with knowledge. And of course, we need to make sure the MI stuff. So, so today, we look at knowledge in terms of its, uh, I suppose there's an isolated view in terms of the performance of the knowledge base. Uh, we can get some very cool stuff here to understand the effectiveness of knowledge. We can also look at knowledge across channels. But the question here is, is this now fit for purpose? Because knowledge is evolving. You know, we've gone from a very passive model of knowledge uh, help center knowledge for web self-service. The customer has to go and get the knowledge. We then start pushing knowledge out a little bit more by putting it in contextual areas and in websites. 
We can look at it this way. So passive knowledge, accessible knowledge, we put it on mobile devices. We allow widgets, as they're called, so the components in left-hand or right-hand columns of websites that are contextual to the web page. Assisted knowledge, not forgetting the fact that we have agents in chat, social, email, that are finding that knowledge for us as end users and giving it to us. So the assisted knowledge is there. That's kind of getting towards push, but it's still a human push. And then as we get further out, this concept of active knowledge. So as we spoke about in the very first session with Ashi, the idea that we're prepared to preempt the situation. We're going to plug that knowledge gap because we know it's just about to happen. And we have those tools to do it today. We have our behavior engine. We have our intervention engine, if you want to call it that, eGain offers. And we have eGain knowledge that's able to push things into those situations. I think the challenge we have at the moment is spotting those interventions to put knowledge in. And I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't got as much of push knowledge going on. You could actually overlay on this Notify. Notify is you know, triggered by back-end events, but is preempting, is pushing knowledge as well. So that, that would also fit in this picture. Offers and knowledge together give you more of an in-the-moment push of knowledge. But, and I look to my the exony part of the family, as we now refer to them. The CJA you've seen demonstrated outside, this gives us the opportunity to find the places where we can push knowledge. So this is the missing piece in my mind. We have the technology to be able to intervene, to use knowledge as an intervention. Knowledge is one of those pieces of the toolkit. We have knowledge, we have all the other channels we can intervene with. But CJA, potentially, with the work we do on top of it, will give us the areas where we should intervene. We can then pretty much, if you think about it, you can start knowledge management if you want to with a single article. And you'll be able to put that article into an offer, and it'll be an intervention, and you'll be able to measure the impact of one article in a customer journey. So if you ever have any concerns about getting your toe in the water, how much knowledge you need to actually make it worthwhile to go live, maybe now it's just one article. CJA then also gives us the ability to prove the worth to understand where we go next in building that knowledge base. So all that, that knowledge process as maybe strategic, um, strategic aims are changing or businesses, the business ecosystem is changing, the ability to make sure our knowledge base is now actually still active and delivering that value as we, uh, we, we look at the analytics, uh, the performance of that knowledge base ongoing. So there's that fantastic feedback loop. The analysis from the data, the reality of what's going on in the digital channels and soon with the, the voice and digital brought in together, the ability to spot the places to intervene, e-gain knowledge as the vehicle to have stuff pushed out, and then the closed loop that goes around. And that for me is where push knowledge ends up. So hopefully what I've talked about this morning has been knowledge for you rather than content. So hopefully it's been relevant to you. And I thank you very much for your time. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.